Hey everyone, on today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, I've got Paul Schneckenberg back on the show, and today we're going to be talking about the story of backup and recovery inside of M365. Now, it's kind of been a confusing road, um, especially with the, well, the no backup needed guidance from Microsoft for all these years. And now more confusingly, Microsoft has their own M365 backup product. So we're gonna be talking about all that. We're gonna be talking about all the different ways and tools that people have used in M365 natively to try and facilitate backup and why they don't work. All that and more coming up on today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, the podcast that brings you the knowledge and insight straight from the security lab here at Hornet Security. As always, I'm your host, Andy Serwich, and I got my co-host back on today. I got Paul Schneckenberg back. How's, how's it going, Paul? I am really good, Andy. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. I, you know, I think the reason we've been seeing you so much lately is there's just so much to talk about in the 365 space, right? And like I said, when I think about 365, you're you know, one of my go-to guys, right? And we've got a an interesting topic today, a topic that I see come up quite frequently inside of the security space and the backup space, and that is um, protecting data inside of Microsoft 365, right? And mainly the kind of the question of like, do I need backup in 365? Does 365 provide that for me. These are all questions that I've heard time and time again over the years. And there's always a lot of confusion around this, right? And I guess where we should maybe start is talk about what Microsoft 365 does in terms of mm -hmm. protecting your data. And then we can get into mm -hmm. some more of the backup conversations later on. And I guess the where I would start with this is the fact that whenever I'm asked this question, like, hey, Andy, um, why do I need backup for 365? I mean, uh, I've got all these different things in 365, right? I've got uh, my in-place hold. I've got retention policies. I've got, um, you know, the administrator recycle bin. My users can recover with the recycle bin. Or mm -hmm. there's the, the OneDrive um, wizard that you can use to recover files. Like, why do I need backup? Well, the way... I always explain this is 365 as a platform is fantastic at retaining data. It was never designed for point in time recovery. Um, yep. And that's, that's the way I've always, I've always viewed it. Um, I think yep. we're on the same page there, right? I think we're definitely on the same page. I think one of the reasons there has been a lot of confusion in this space is because for <laughs> ever since Office 365, really, or BPOS days, Microsoft's position has been very clear. They don't think you need backup. Right. right? Like, and that's, I think, in many ways, why people have been confused. Because, of course, there are a lot of third-party providers of backup. Um, so it's been a bit confusing, right? It's 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 been a bit of a confusing messaging. And as we'll cover later, Microsoft has changed their tune. So clearly right. something changed there. Right, so, definitely. And I... um, so let's talk a little bit about data resiliency and what that means. So Microsoft is very determined not to lose your data. They're very determined that um, if you if they have a failure of their infrastructure, they're not going to lose your data. Like you're not going to get an email one day saying, hey, sorry, we lost your mailbox because a server had a hard drive failure or a right. server rack failed or a, a region failed. So on the Exchange side, what they're doing is they have uh, Exchange Server running your mailboxes and that database availability group is a function of Exchange Server, yep. even if you're running it on-premises. So you get multiple copies of your uh, database. And that database, um, you get four copies, three replicated between three different servers and a fourth one as a lagged copy in a separate uh, region yep. so that if there is a corruption of the data, they have an uncorrupted version that they can go back to. Uh, and SharePoint does a similar thing. It's got multiple copies of your of your database in multiple locations so that you, you they won't lose your data. 
but that's not that that's all about losing what you have exactly right now and as you said the, the whole point is there is no way of going back in time easily right now as part of that native data resiliency protection they have some features where you can get things back that have been deleted by mistake so in sharepoint slash onedrive <clears throat> you mentioned the onedrive wizard that lets you recover from a um a ransomware event where all your files were encrypted you can sort of like restore your whole sharepoint right drive like for those of you who don't know onedrive for business is running as a site running on top of sharepoint in the background so uh it lets you go back in time and, and recover it to a point in time uh, but again only within the number of days that they provide there i think it might be 30 days right for sharepoint in general we have a 93 day time limit so you delete a document as an end user it ends up in a recycle bin in sharepoint you can go in there you can recover that for up to 93 days but if somebody deletes or empties the recycle bin or empties that document out of the recycle bin it ends up in a second stage recycle bin that only administrators have access to they can then go in and recover that for whatever is left so if a days are left so if a user deletes it out of the recycle bin after 45 five days you got another 48 days if my math is correct <laughs> to get it back from the second stage recycle bin uh user accounts that are right. deleted are by default kept for 30 days their mail boxes are soft deleted and kept for 30 days in case you need to recover them um very common of course is converting a user who's departed their mailbox to a shared mailbox so that you still have access to it in case um you know there's some data you want to get out of that mailbox right um, right so so that's all the sort of recovery bits that you can do uh without taking any other actions right and i i think this is where it kind of gets interesting and you start seeing some very mm -hmm. strange practices um, once you get to this point because I, I think most people will agree that the 30 days and the 93 days if i'm going to rely on that solely that just isn't enough i mean how many times no. have we had an end user come to us and say hey uh i deleted this file i, I don't know it was a couple weeks ago uh, in it was in this one folder and it was called something like this and you end up digging for it and lo and behold, it was deleted like, you know, six weeks ago, right? I mean, mm -hmm. fringe case, but it does happen now. Absolutely. So we do see people try to get around the 30 and the 93 day limitations, right? By using some other services in 365. <laughs> and I've had people come up to me and say, hey, uh, what about litigation hold in 365? And I think um, the proper name for it is um, in place hold, right? Yeah. But so it, it's changed names it's, a couple of times, yes. <laughs> So what some organizations do to work around this, um, the, the previous data resiliency features we talked about is they use in place hold. So this is a feature designed to help in legal cases where you have an internal investigation of a user. Maybe you suspect them of doing something that they shouldn't be doing and you want to make sure they can't delete any evidence in the form of emails or documents, right? So you put their locations under in place hold. Um, <clears throat> and then everything they delete, like even if they empty their recycle bin in Outlook, all the emails and ca calendar items, etc., are all kept in a recoverable items folder behind the scenes that you can then search and recover items from. But this is not a backup solution. <laughs> you know what I mean? This right. is not a this is not an enterprise or even a small business backup solution for anyone, right? It doesn't have a good user interface, and it's not designed for that. That's not what it's there for. I think that's the the case, right? Is like it's that perfect example of like the right tool for the right job. It's great at what that's it right. does, right? But it was never intended for point in time recovery in disaster recovery scenarios. So. That's exactly right. Uh, which then brings me to the next kind of uh, unintended service, I would say, that people try to <laughs> shoehorn into the backup role, and that is retention yeah. policies. Kind of the same thing, right? That's right. Um, why don't you tell us about that really quick? So if you have a regulation that you need to retain data of a particular type or certain 
you know, locations, whatever, for a certain amount of time, whatever that might be, three years, five years, seven years, whatever. So you can use retention policies. In the past, you used to have to do them separately in SharePoint Server and Exchange Server. Now you can do like a unified one across all of Teams and SharePoint and a few other locations as well. And you basically create a retention policy that says uh, data in these locations uh, should not be deleted. So if somebody goes into SharePoint to delete the document, it then ends up in a hidden folder and it's kept for the number of years or month or years or days, or whatever you set your retention policy to. Right. And then you can have various things happen after that. Like you could have the documents just being deleted automatically once the retention policy uh, expires, or you can have, uh, you can even have like uh, reviews after a disposition review where certain users get notified and can then decide about the, these now seven-year-old documents, whether they should be kept or a new retention policy or they should just be deleted, however, right? So, so you can manage all of that. But again, this is not a backup and recovery solution. This is a regulatory requirement retention policy. And in all these cases, I think it's really important to think about this. Right. Now, when we used to do backup on premises, and people still do, the whole point was the backup data is separate from your production data. Right. Like you take copies of your VMs, you take copies of your data, you take copies of your mailboxes and you put them somewhere else, right? Yep. Whether that's in the cloud or on tape or external hard drive or wherever they go, right? All of these solutions that we just talked about, all of the data is still stored in the same place as the production data. There is no copying of data anywhere. There's no separate systems anywhere. It's all in the same place. And I think that's the important distinction there, right? Because when I think about 365, if, if I'm thinking about the storage behind 365, I always kind of picture it as like a SAN in my, in my brain, right? For those that maybe aren't you know, infrastructure engineers, storage area networks, basically just a big tower full of disks that we used to run on premises, still running on premises in a lot of cases, right? But you would, I, I still remember a, a customer I used to work for years and years ago. Um, they were a brand new customer. I was walking into their building for the first time and just kind of getting the lay of the land. Like, oh, hey, that's a cool compellent sand that you've got running over there. Looks nice. That's where all your production data is. Yeah, yeah, we, we send the backups there too. <laughs> I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's a separate set of disks. because I, I carved off these different disks for backup. I'm like, but still sitting on the same device, ultimately same control back plane, same OS, same firmware. Like, uh, anyway, so I kind of look at 365 through that lens sometimes, right? And, um, the example I always think of is on top of that, if I'm looking at 365 from a threat actor perspective is a global admin account is like the crown jewel that I'm after, right? If I get my hands yeah. on a global admin account, I mean, all bets are off, right? At that, mm -hmm. at that point, I have full unfettered access to the entire tenant. I, I could go clear out admin recycle bins. I could, you know... There's all kinds of mischief I could get up to. And at that point, Absolutely. all that data retention doesn't matter anymore. Now, no, I, that is absolutely correct. And I, you know, I hear people say like, well, you just protect your global admin accounts really well. And I'm like, yeah, good advice, but stuff happens, absolutely. you know, stuff happens. It does. <laughs> and so it does. I, it does. It absolutely does. And the other thing I think of is that there are documented cases of ransomware impacting 365. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, in some cases, the uh, some of the inbox retention tools might get you out of a bind there. But to your point earlier, Paul, a lot of those tools are not designed for backup and recovery. And they would be... Uh, terribly arduous to use those tools to conduct a recovery operation across an entire organization. I, you know, yeah. so those are some of the things I, I think of. And to kind of come full circle back to what you said at the beginning of the episode, in that it's always been confusing around having backup for 365, right? Because Microsoft historically, historically has said, you don't need backup for 365. Well, 
that's not really the case anymore. Um, I forget what event oh. it was, but recently um, <laughs> they announced their Bill own. Maybe? Or Inspire. <laughs> it was one of the two. I don't remember which one. It, it was one of the two. But no, I don't they, either, actually. They announced their own 365 backup application. Um, yep. Microsoft 365 backup, I believe, is what they called it. Um, and... I, it's been kind of interesting watching this. So when I initially saw the videos and the, the announcements, my initial gut reaction was like, this seems fairly limited, right? So it didn't cover the full breadth of 365 services. Um, there was a lot of vague marketing speak around the details. Um, you know, and, and I, I think the biggest thing that's really interesting is the fact that it's probably been two, three, four months as of the time of this recording since we've heard anything about this service. It's just been crickets yep. ever since that initial announcement. Yep. And I, so we don't really know what the scope of that's going to be. And, you know, I what the way I see this is, is I'm not I'm not entirely convinced Microsoft is entering that space because they believe 365 needs backup. Part of me wonders if they just want part of the backup pie, right? They want they want some of that business because um, they've also started offering a new API to ISVs like Hornet Security that, hey, here's this new backup API that we're going to charge for type of thing, right? And in true Microsoft fashion, I, you know, I believe it's, don't quote me on this. I'm not on the development side, but I believe it's um, quite um, cost effective to get started now. But historically, what they've done with these APIs is later on, they raise the price, right? So one way or the other, I believe they're going to try and get a piece of that pie, either through their own backup service or via ISVs that are utilizing that, that backend API. But we'll do another episode specifically on that API. But anyway... I think that's kind of what the driving factor is behind this. And where I go with this then is like, okay, well, if they have their own solution, like do people use that type of thing? And I don't know about you, Paul, but I, in my experience, Microsoft's backup services have been kind of a mixed bag over the years. Um, I <laughs> look at, um, System Center Data Protection Manager, I have not, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not a fan. I've never had good luck with that application. I, there were, there was a version or two that like, I worked on getting, just getting it installed for like an hour and a half and just gave up. I'm like, no, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. Um, I, I, I think we're of deferring opinions on that. I, I think you've, you've actually we had good indeed. luck with it. Yeah, no, I have, and this is this is cool actually because often we agree on most things. I know, all right? It's right? Cool having a, a disagreement. No, um, I used System Center Data Protection Manager. I taught students on System Center Data Protection Manager, ran it in various lab scenarios. Um, never did a full implementation for a client, but that wasn't because I didn't think it would work. I think that was more because uh, I didn't have the clients of the size needed. Now, back in the day, Microsoft did put a lot of effort into this product. So we're talking like, you know, System Center 2007 or 2012 or something. It was a pretty good product, I think, uh, for the time, um, you know, obviously on-premises focused, uh, obviously part of the overall System Center suite. So like with many other things back in the day, if you bought the whole System Center suite, you sort of got the backup product as part of it. And then you, you know, you wouldn't necessarily spend money on a third party product because you'd already paid for it as part of the system center suite, even if you perhaps were more inclined to implement operations manager or configuration right. manager back in the day, right? They were sort of more, more um, attractive workloads, perhaps. Right. Um, so, no, I, I really like it. I suppose the last three versions or so, uh, like anything with system center, except for configuration manager, receiving zero love, um, or right. close to zero love. So, right. so I wouldn't like, it's not a recommended product today. That's for sure. Uh, the, the one quick sideline I will mention there is that if you do have a large set of workloads on premises and you want to back them up to Azure, you can use Azure backup service. 
So MABS, Microsoft Azure Backup Server, is essentially data protection manager. You download it, you, it's free. You download it, you install it, and you simply uh, configure it to back up your workloads on-prem to local disk on your DPM server or your MAB server, and then you can also replicate that data to the cloud. But you're paying per workload that you're backing up. Right, right. Uh, interesting. I was going to say, you know, you mentioned free, and I'm like, okay, wait, Azure service, free. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, oh and stuff. of course you're paying for the storage in Azure right, as well. So, right, yeah. right, exactly. So, um, I think the only service on Azure that's free that I'm aware of are uh, Azure websites, right? Um, and boy, yeah, the basic ones I've, are free. Yeah, it's been a while since I've used those, but I seem to remember that. So, um, you know, which all of this kind of brings me back to the key points um, around backup for 365. And I've seen this with Microsoft with in several areas over the years in that they have a kind of an internal policy, I guess you would say, where when they enter a sector of the market, in this case, backup, <clears throat> 365 backup specifically, they will create functionality or a very base level product that says, this is the base level functionality that we believe an application in this sector of the industry should have. If you want over and above that, you go to a third party provider, right? And, you know, I, yes, I'm biased. I've got the Hornet security logo on right here. But when I look at my, you do too, look at that, there we go. But when I'm looking at the uh, M365 backup, the product that they announced, in my brain, I'm already comparing it, you know, them versus us. And we're already doing way over and above um, what they, you know, had announced, right? And I, I think it yep. comes back to the fact too that if they really are entering the backup market for 365, they're going to be playing catch up in some way, shape or form. Because I mean, us in the backup space for 365, we've been doing this for years. Like we've been doing mm -hmm. it for years and I know it's their platform, but we've been doing this for years. Um, yep. And so they're going to be, if they're really entering that space, uh, again, like I said earlier, I'm not entirely convinced that they are truly whole hog, it, uh, completely invested in entering that space. But if they are, it's going to take them a while to get up to, up to scratch there. So yeah. Well, I think so. yeah. So, I mean, it's been an interesting conversation, but one thing I wanted to kind of mention before we sign off for the episode here, Paul, is um, we actually spent some time talking about uh, a lot of the stuff we mentioned today inside of your recent M365 Essentials Companion Guide ebook, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it's got 16 or 17 chapters, I think on various aspects one of those covers backup of course and and um you know the all the things we talked about today and what you need to consider if you have a microsoft 365 tenant uh, whether it's you know five users or five hundred thousand users what should you think about um and it covers all the basics um that's what we called it the essential companion right. guide this is version three so it's gone through a few iterations and it's it's up to date um which is kind of useful and it's completely free to download and it is a fantastic piece of content. Folks, uh, for you watching slash listening, I'll be sure Thank to you. include a link to that inside of the show notes. Again, like Paul mentioned, we talked a, a lot um, about data protection and backup in today's episode. There's going to be some of that contained in the ebook along with a bunch of other stuff. So again, I'll be sure to include a link to that piece of content. Um, again, we talked a lot about backup. Again, we do backup for 365 here at Hornet Security. Um, we also do uh, backup and recovery of on-premises virtual machines as well too. So we have a VM backup application. So I'll be sure to include links to both of those in the show notes as well in case you're interested in checking those out. But other than that, Paul, I think we're a wrap on today's episode. Anything you want to add before we sign off? Yeah, I do actually want to wrap up with one thing here to sort of uh, do a full circle here because we've talked about all the different bits, right? But yeah. I think what's it's very important is that you sit down as a Microsoft 365 admin, uh, you sit down with the business and you really work out not the technical bits, because that's what we've talked about today, but overall, yeah. what does it mean to the business? Do a threat model. If 
your network connection is down and nobody can get to Microsoft 365. What does that look like? How many people right. do you have that's dependent on that network connection? How many people work from home? If there's another type of outage in uh, Microsoft 365, if you can't authenticate, but your data is still there, how do you manage that? Do you have backup in a third party system that you can get to? Like I want, you know, think through all of those concepts so that you have given some thought to the different scenarios that might hit you so that you're not just blindly assuming Microsoft's going to be up. And then when they're not yeah. up and there is some sort of outage, you go, well, that's it. We'll just sit here and twiddle our thumbs, right? Like right. you really do want to think this through because these things are no longer like 20 years ago, people would go, oh, well, the computer is down, so I'm going to grab my piece of paper and I'm going to work through the old manual yep. process, right? Like that just doesn't happen anymore right. in most businesses. So you really do need to think this through holistically in your business. How do we manage incidents? How do we are we resilient to disasters from a minor disaster to a major disaster? How do we manage this? And that's where I think people should start. And then from there, you can then work through all those concepts um, and then get to a place where these technologies that we talked about really fit into your overall business strategy. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, that that uh, makes me think of our business continuity service here at Harness Security. So in the rare event that 365 is offline, it's rare, but it does happen, um, we do have the ability to allow you access to your services, uh, the data stored within our services. Um, so your business can keep running while 365 gets their stuff sorted out. So, well, Paul, I want to thank you for taking some time and uh, explaining all this stuff to us today. It's great talking to you as always, my friend. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, it was fabulous. It was a great Definitely. conversation. Thank you. Definitely. And those of you watching, uh, thanks for spending some time with us today. If you found value in today's episode, be sure to uh, hit that subscribe button. We're available out on YouTube and all the major podcasting platforms. With that, we'll let you go and uh, hope to see you again for another episode. Stay safe out there. We'll catch you later. Thanks for watching.